Good morning, brothers and sisters. Last time when we looked at Genesis, we saw that God was a powerful God who created the universe with just one word, let there be. We also found that he was a purposeful God and had purposes for creating the universe, which were to do with the human being. And we start to look at that this morning. Let's pray before we do. Heavenly Father, we ask that you'll give us understanding of your word and help us to apply that word to our lives. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the human being, what is it? Is it the glory or the garbage of the universe? What are we to make of this enigmatic creature, a creature capable of sending spaceships to exact locations on other planets and even on a, a, a comet as happened recently? Or painting paintings like the ones in the Sistine Chapel? Or composing a Mozart symphony? But also wiping out hundreds of millions of people in just two world wars within the last century. How are we to understand ourselves in a universe where we're just an infinitesimal speck of dust compared with the utter vastness of the universe? The modern artist Francis Bacon said, man now realizes that he's an accident, that he's a completely futile being. And no wonder, a couple of years ago, Time magazine told us that chimpanzees and humans share almost 99% of their DNA. You are 98.77% chimpanzee. I wonder whether you knew that. Of course, we share with the way animals eat and sleep and breathe and mate. But instead of saying in this article that we're mere animals, the article concluded by saying that the 1% differences are so different that human achievements of agriculture, language, art, music, technology, and philosophy make it ridiculous to see human beings as chimpanzees in business suits. There's something different about us. The magazine didn't quite say what was the difference. But in case you're worried about all that, you also share 27% of your genes with daffodils. Daffodils are a type of flower. You're one quarter daffodil. We'll balance all this up with this fact. You have 20 million kilometers of DNA inside your body. That's just incredible. With 3.2 billion pieces of information in every cell of your body. David says in Psalm 139, we're fearfully and wonderfully made. And he didn't know what we do today. So what are we then? What are we meant to do? Where do we place humanity? Is that at center stage or right at the edges of the universe? Creation's crown or is it creation's shame? So let's look at the place of human beings in God's creation. Genesis 1 has a subversive function. Its purpose is to overthrow the worldview of the ancient cultures around Israel. Everything that's worshiped by these other cultures Genesis says it's all God's good creation. That's all it is. And so Genesis overthrows or debunks other world views. Well, this subversive intention reaches its climax in its description of the place given to men and women in the world by the creator. Genesis actually redefines what being a human being is all about. It's really quite different from other worldviews, other ancient worldviews and worldviews even today. I mentioned last time the 3,000 year old stone tablets discovered in Iraq with the Babylonian creation story and Numa Elish engraved upon them. Numa Elish was the common story of the surrounding nations about the origins of the human person and of the place of human beings in the God's plans. It tells of the primeval war of the gods. And the winner god was a young god called Marduk. His armies killed the mother and father gods. And out of the bits of the dead gods, Marduk creates bits of the universe. So one part of the gods created the heavens, the other part created the earth. And the gods who had supported these defeated gods were sentenced to an eternity of servitude. 
their punishment was to collect and prepare food for the victor gods. Now here's where the human being comes in. The defeated gods begin to complain about the indignity of having to get food for other gods. They said, but we're gods, we shouldn't have to get food for other people. So they asked Marduk to create some other creature who was more suited to a life of slavery. And you guessed it, he creates the human being. Marduk makes a man out of the pools of blood left over from the battle. What does this tell the reader? It tells us that man's central task in life is to serve the gods with offerings, especially food offerings. Let me quote the Enuma Elish. Marduk says, I will establish a savage. Man shall be his name. He shall be charged with the service of the gods, that they may be at ease so that they can have a good time together. The clear message of the story is that humans ought to know their place at the bottom of the divine scheme of things. They're the scum, the, the rubbish of the universe. They're just savages. And their role was as slaves to serve the needs and the pleasures of the gods. Well, it's against such views of humanity that Genesis has something striking to say. According to Genesis, men and women lie at the very centre of God's intentions, as well as his affections for the world, his feelings for the world. This theme is shown in several ways. One way is the deliberate interruption of chapter 1's rhythmic structure. Remember, Genesis 1 was a highly patterned account. Each creative scene follows a careful fourfold pattern. There's a creative command, let there be, let there be light. There's a report of its fulfilment, and it was so. There's a, then a creative detail about that. And then there's a concluding day formula. The evening and the morning were the first day, the second day, and so on. Well, now day six starts like any other day in verse 24. But then the pattern breaks down. God doesn't say, let there be man, as we'd expect from the pattern so far. Rather, the Creator declares to himself, he says, let us make man in our image. Now, in a highly patterned and repetitive piece of writing like this, such a break is very emphatic. Ancient readers would be sitting up and taking note. They'd be expecting that they've arrived at something special, the climax of the story. The contrast with the Numa Elish is very striking, isn't it? Humans were last in the list of creative acts in the Numa Elish because they were just an afterthought, a necessary evil to give a life of ease for the, for the gods. Well, they're also last in the list of creative acts in Genesis, but it's because they are the high point, the final point of God's intentions for creation. In fact, they're the point of God's creation itself. So are we mere animals? Well, notice that humanity does share the sixth day with other land animals, verses 24 and 25. Like them, we're made of dust. We feed, we reproduce. They're half of our context. So it's no surprise then that we share a percentage of our DNA with animals. Humanity is in nature, but we're also different. So what makes us different? First is our special creation, seen in the startling phrase, let us. Here it is God deliberating within himself in personal involvement. He takes personal care over us. The second difference is the role that we have as we're designated image of God when God made us. And it's something quite different and opposite of the Babylonian understanding. You see, in the Numa Elish, the first man was fashioned out of the blood of defeated gods. The man, in other words, was made up of chopped up bits of dead gods, the leftovers, to put it crudely. But in Genesis 1, we're told that men and women were created in the very image of God. Verse 27 makes this point quite emphatically. Notice the repetition of it. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So what is this image? Well, image has two basic aspects. First is to represent God in rule, verses 26 and 28. The well-known phrase, the image of God, was well known in the ancient world. 
It was used as statues of gods set up in pagan cities. These were regarded as representatives, images of the gods' rule over the people. They more or less said to anyone coming to the city, who's in charge here? And the answer was well, the gods were in charge. Many other ancient cultures also described their kings or their emperors as divine images. Kings and emperors were often considered divine representatives or ambassadors of the gods. And they believed they exercised rule for the gods over the people. They were often very ruthless in doing that. When we look at Genesis, though, it's telling us that human beings are not the product of defeated God's blood. They're not mere slaves either. Rather, they're God's representatives. Human beings are God's vice regent, second in charge, placed over all creation to have dominion over it, to rule it. They're created to exercise God's rule over the creation, to ensure that God's interests are realized in the world, to bring rest to all creation as they increasingly spread out from the Garden of Eden to the wider world outside it. We're to be like God in, like, in that we've got a job like God, godlike job to do to rule now this means the work that we do in caring for creation on god's behalf this is a kingly fashion it's saying that all people have this kingly job to care for creation so genesis 1 turns the ancient notions of what a human being is and what he's to do turns it upside down all people not just kings or or in, Emperors are the image of the true God. Now, this is really a revolutionary thought in the ancient world where common people, people like you and I, who are not kings and emperors, the common people, the majority of people in the world were thought of as worth really nothing at all. Human life was very cheap according to the kings and emperors of this world. So human beings are to rule the world, we're told that rule as God's representatives and they're to be like God as they rule earth like God. Well, that was the first aspect of being the image of God. The second one is that we represent God in our relationships to each other. Verse 27, human beings are also representatives in this way. We're to be like God in the way we relate. Both men and women are in the image of God. And the radical view here is that we're both men and women, the image of God. The, the ancient, other ancient traditions actually believed it was only the man who was the image of God and the woman wasn't. We are told that we represent God to each other and together to the world. God is relational within himself. The New Testament tells us he's Trinity, three in one. So to be like God is to be relational. We're made to relate to others. We're made to relate to God, reflecting God's grace and glory to each other. We get a picture of what God-like relationships are to be like in verse 29. Now remember, the purpose of humanity, according to Enuma Elish and the other pagan myths, was that human beings were to serve the gods with offerings, especially food offerings. So verse 29 would have sounded very odd to ancient people. Well, having told the humans to exercise divine rule over the earth, God then offers human beings food. God said, I give you every seed bearing plant on the face of the whole earth. They will be yours for food. Here God is serving us. God is a servant heart. He's a servant God. What a subversive thought this was in ancient times. It's a theme that reaches its climax in the equally radical notion of the Lord of the universe, Jesus Christ, offering himself for the sins of, world, of the world. And that's pictured in him stooping down lowly, washing his disciples' dirty and smelling feet. To be the image means to serve as Christ serves, especially husbands to wives but all to each other and us to the earth. So being like God means displaying the qualities of God, values of loving service, 
values of relationship. These values are built into the way we are, or at least the way we should be. Any act of abuse against another person, another human person, is an act of high treason against God himself, whose image we bear and to whose kingship we bear witness. So the image is really telling us more what a person is to be and to do. It's not a list of qualities that we have. That's often been the case in some of the older theology textbooks. You look up image of God and it gives just a list of qualities. But we are the image of God on earth. We, human beings. That's one of the reasons why there was a strict prohibition on idols and images in the Old Testament tabernacle and also the later Old Testament temple. It wasn't just that the living and true God couldn't possibly be represented by a dead piece of wood or, or a stone or especially a picture. It was also that God already has an image, you and I. That's why we, there were no images in the Jewish temple or the Jewish synagogues. There was one already, you see, each person representing God to others. So there's no place for any other sort of image as if God wasn't immediately present with us. We represent and reflect God to each other in loving relationships and we represent God to the world by ruling it responsibly and caring for it and caring for the creatures of this world. This involves great privilege, but it also involves responsibility. It's not right to exploit the position as the rulers of this world have over the, all the years of history. We must care for creation like God cares for creation. So, being in the image of God results in rule under him and above all, serving relationships with him and with others. It's our responsibility before him to be like this. But there is a problem isn't there, with our ex representing God in both our rule and relationships today. Think about the idea of ruling. The creation story tells us that creation isn't merely a mechanism, a machine to exploit and to use. It's a project in which we're invited to share by God. As part of creation, we're bound up in God's purposes for it. We've got a job description to be like God with the responsibility that goes with being his image. We're to be like God who delights in his creation. In verse 31 of chapter 1, where God pronounced the world, the creation, as being very good. We're to be like God who sustains and cares for creation, as he does in verses 29 and 30. And as we see the first man doing, as he tends the garden in chapter 2, thus extending the peace of the garden to the world outside Eden. It's a servant king whom we're to image. So here's our job description, to be God's image, to rule and care as God does and represent him. The problem is that that's not the way we see things here today. Instead of ruling the planet by caring for it, nourishing it and loving it, we've actually raped the planet plundering it and despoiling it for our own selfish ends. Why does this happen? Because we've lost the qualifications for the job, as we will see in Genesis 3. We don't seem to be in the image now. We were made to be as God, reflecting him, but we've disqualified ourselves by our rebellion, our disobedience, our sin, which fractures our relationships with him. So a rule is anything like God's rule over us. Our own jobs become the selfish means of exploitation of the world and of other people. So what's the way out of this? Let's look at the second problem before we give the solution. The problem of relationships. There's a problem here too. We're made to represent God to each other and God to others, being like God to others. In our relationships, we're to love and cherish others. This is especially so in families. The husband represents God to his wife and the wife to her husband. 
This means not dominating. God is never dominating. But it means loving sacrificial service, especially of husbands to wives and parents to children. We're to delight in others and to be there for them as God does. He takes delight with his people and he's there for us. He never tires of being there for us. Well, the problem is that our relationships have turned to exploitation and demand or just plain neglect. We're more like the Babylonian gods that demand people serve them than like the true God who serves us. We make me first the motto of our lives and we focus attention on me instead of conveying God to each other. Rather, we should be representing God in how we work in our marriages, in our graciousness to others, in our lifestyles. But even if we try hard, left to ourselves, we don't get it right, do we? Like ruling, we've really made a mess of it. So where do we find the true image of God today? How can we be the image? How do we overcome the terrible tension between being the glory and the garbage of the universe? Well, there is a solution. It's God who gave us the role to be his image, and only he can equip us for it. The solution is that he sent the one who did have all the qualifications for the job, the one who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, in Colossians 1 and 15. He is the true person, the one who reveals the truth of God, Interestingly, Hebrews chapter 2 comments on Psalm 8 about this, that we human beings were given dominion over creation and given glory and honour. But he also says, the writer also says, we don't see human beings that way today, but we do see Jesus who perfectly fulfils that role for us. He reflects the true God as the true image. He rules as the true image. And through knowing him, trusting him with being recreated into the image of Christ. So if sin robbed humankind of this function, Jesus' death and resurrection restores it. This sort of thinking contradicts all human ideals of what makes a human person truly human. Ideals that say things like, well, it's our money that make us important and give, makes me a real person. It's my position over other people which make me more important and make me feel like a human being. Or it's the job, what I do, that makes a person. Well, instead, the Bible tells us that we find our true self by being in Christ. We're only truly human by being in relationship with him and being transformed into that image that we were meant to be. We're told that all things were created by Christ and for him. He's not only the creator, but the re-creator, remaking us to be like him and so share his role as image. The end of the Bible in the book of Revelation, chapters 21 and 22, we see the final outworking of this as we're finally made to be the image of God, like God, in fellowship with him in relationships and each with us each with each other and ruling with him. So, what place do men and women occupy in creation? Is it shame or glory? Well, I think it's a little bit of both, really, at the moment. There's an astonishing balance in the Bible's view of the human being. Other worldviews fluctuate between the person as the measure of all things, the greatest being created, or the naked ape, emptied of all meaning, significance and purpose. We are an enigma. We are the shame and the glory of the universe. But that's not how it was meant to be, nor will it be. We were created for a purpose, with a job description. And although we've failed miserably, that status is being restored to us in Christ. He is the image of God. And in him, if we trust him, we're being recreated to a whole new creation. Our humanity is being restored. This is our great, great hope. When we despair of ourselves, we despair of our sin, we despair of our weaknesses in life, we despair of the sicknesses that we have which are sapping our energy and our life from us. 
But we have a great hope that this will not be the end. In our transformation then, we have a job to be God's image. How wonderful that will be. And when my son was about five, five years old, he imitated and reflected me. He got the, his high chair and set it up as a pulpit and he put his Bible on it. And he also arranged all the soft toys he and his sister had and he put them in front of the pulpit. And he got up and he preached to the, the soft toys, very much like what church is like today. Well, as adults, we also imitate at the core of our beings. We're imaging creatures. God created us to be imaging beings who reflect his glory to others and to the world. To be the image of something always means letting that something appear, revealing it, showing what it's truly like. So that's our job, to reveal what God is like by the way we treat others. So let me ask you, what do you reflect? What do you reflect? Think of the way you treat your wife or your husband. Are you reflecting God there? Think of the way you treat your employees if you're an employer or fellow workers if you're an employee. Are you reflecting God in that situation of work? How, how are you treating your helper? Are you reflecting God there? Think about your lifestyle and the use of this planet. Are you reflecting God there? Important and big questions. What do you reflect? You see, we reflect what we worship. God's made us to reflect Him, caring for the world and representing God to others in loving, serving relationships. That's being human. But if we're not reflecting God, we're actually reflecting something else. It's not possible to be neutral in this. We either reflect the loving creator or something in creation that is less than God. And then, if that is so, we become less human ourselves. If we're worshipping something that is less than God, we become like what we worship. So those who worship money increasingly define themselves in terms of money and increasingly treat others as creditors or debtors or customers rather than as human beings. Those who worship sex increasingly define themselves in terms of it also, about preferences and practices, and they increasingly treat others as actual or potential partners or sexual objects rather than a person, human person. And those who worship power in this world, and there's many of those, increasingly define themselves in terms of it and start to treat others as collaborators, competitors, or especially as pawns to be used for their sake and not for others. All these are forms of idolatry and they damage our true humanity. They damage our image-bearing quality. They ruin us as human beings. So once again, let me ask, what are you reflecting this morning? Because we're made to reflect Jesus, the true human being. So what are you going to do about it? So let's pray about that. Heavenly Father, forgive us for not reflecting the grace and love and glory of Jesus in the way we live in this world, in the way we use our world and how we relate to others. Thank you that by your Spirit you are making us like Christ. And we pray that this process will become more evident as we continually give ourselves to you and to others. Amen.